recording. All right. Check. Where did my notebook go? All right. So I don't want to say too much more about uh, rings of fractions. Uh, it's just sort of a construction that you are likely to see again if you go on and take more algebra stuff. Um, but just uh, so more from 7.5. I mean, I'm going to give some exercises about it. Uh, I, I really recommend uh, to try to prove all the little parts of the stuff that I skipped. Um, that's that's a recommendation that I have there. So it's basically, I mean, it's the first exercise I think mentioned in the in the section at the end of the section. Um, yeah, it says fill in all the details in the proof of theorem fifteen. Uh, I recommend that. Um, just definitions uh, notation. Uh, so just keeping the same notation as last time. So again, like D is a subset of R. Here R is a commutative ring. And um, D is multiplicatively closed or closed under multiplication. Multiplication and D does not contain um, zero or zero divisors. You have to say both of those things because by definition, technically zero is not a zero divisor. Um, so the notation here, D inverse R is the uh, ring called Q in theorem, in, in that theorem. So, and again, uh, D inverse R is equal to basically the set of fractions of the form R over D such that R is in R, D is in D. Um, with the, uh, oh, maybe this is a a, bad, a poor choice of notation to put, to put here, but uh, I'll just say where R over D is equal to S over E, if and only if R E equals D S. It's a set of things like that, and it it just works the way that you would want it to work. Um, so just when D is equal to everything except for zero, uh, D inverse R is a field uh, called the field of fractions. Of R. So that's a really common term in algebra, the field of fractions of a ring, commutative ring. And uh, this is a field uh, because, so the only thing to show is that, um, so this is when, uh, when R has no zero divisors. In other words, when R is an integral domain. OK. 
Okay. Um, and this is a field because if uh, so, if R over D uh, is not zero, and zero here means the equivalence class. of 0 over d for any any d in your set. It, basically, 0 is understood as 0 over something. And, you know, we, we typically write, all, I mean, yeah, we typically would just write uh, Things like, okay, sorry, let me finish one thought at a time. So if R over D is not zero, uh, this means uh, R is not zero. So there's, uh, so, so that means R is actually in D. So D over R is an element of the that set. Uh, so R over D times D over R equals R D over R D, which is equal to the thing that we call one, which is the equivalence class of D over D for any d that's what that's the thing that we call one and you can check that anyway so over d has an inverse so this is just sort of formalizing a bunch of ideas about how fractions work that should be fairly intuitive since we're used to working with fractions uh, in a familiar setting. But the idea here is that we can consider other examples. So um, you know if R is in so so a couple of comments. Uh, so I said a little bit about this, but um, If if I let d prime, so d is just one of these sets, like described up here. If I let d prime equal d union the units of the ring, then d inverse r is going to be essentially equal. <laughs> um, I'm just going to write equal instead of isomorphic because I want to be a little bit stronger. So that you get the same thing. Um, yeah. Because uh, you know, over here I have elements of the form like R over U, where U is a unit. But because U is a unit, uh, this is equal to um, R times V over U V, where U V is equal to one. U being a unit means that it has an inverse. And these are equal. And so this is uh, yeah. I mean, basically, and then over, uh, and then uh, yeah.
this is going to be uh, the thing we called iota of R V. I guess the uh, the iota associated with d prime. I guess here. So if I have an iota from R to d inverse R, and I have an, another iota from R to this d prime inverse R. Um, I don't know. You, basically, you could try to formalize it, but the idea is that you're trying to give everything an inverse, and everything already has an inverse uh, if it's a unit. So you might as well just include all of those. So uh, this is sort of always implicit. This is why I was saying you should add the assumption that D just contains all the units because it simplifies your life. Um, It is, it, uh, so, um, good question. So, if, uh, say, x and y are in d prime, then uh, you look at x, y. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, I guess I should uh, maybe be a little bit more careful here. Uh, so what I really mean is... Um, Yeah, this is a very good point. So um, I'm going to put little brackets like this, uh, where I just sort of mean the like closure of this set under multiplication. So you you take all possible everything in in your in whatever you started with. I mean, the point is that there's just no, uh, yeah, you do have to include other things. So so you, you have to include units of the ring and then you, if you include those and you want this set to be multiplicatively closed, which of course you should, then you wanna also include anything that looks like an element of D times a unit. Uh, Uh, so yeah, I just mentioned that. That's what I mean by this. I don't want to talk about that too much. <laughs> I mean, not that like, uh, it's just sort of tedious to work out the details. The, the, this is the, the idea that, that you can just, uh, you know, anything where the denominator was a unit is already in the original ring anyway. Uh, basically. Yeah, I think generally just assume that D contains all the units of R. If I were to give an exercise, I would just assume that it did. So that, Because otherwise it just makes life annoying to have to write down things. So yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe just one other comment. Um, so it's just some examples of fields of fractions. So if R is Z, um, field of fractions is of that is Q and that's sort of the construction that we're modeling everything off of. Um, if you do R to be um, something that's already 
a field, then the field of fractions will just be the same ring that you started out with. Uh, if you do R to be something like um, Z bracket X, which is polynomials. I mean, we've used the notation before, hopefully, so it means polynomials in just the one variable X. Um, then the, the field of fractions. So it looks like you have a set of things that look like F of X over G of X, uh, such that uh, I mean, F of X is a polynomial with integer coefficients. G of X is a polynomial with integer coefficients. And G of X is not the zero polynomial. G of X is allowed to be a polynomial that sometimes equals zero but it's not allowed to just be the function that is identically zero, right? And this actually, um, this set equals what we would denote by Q parentheses X, which is rational functions Uh, with so in X with coefficients in Q and the reason why these are equal when these both have in so so the, and this literally means uh, the set of f of X over G of X such that f of X is in Q brackets X and G of X is in Q brackets X and G of X is not the zero polynomial. So these, these might look a little bit different, but you can tell that they're actually equal by um, the fact that you can take, you can multiply. So like, for example, I'll just give like one example. You could have like one half x squared over two thirds x minus one fifth or whatever. And you could, that's equal to, if I were to just like multiply the top and bottom by uh, like 30 or something, you know, 15 x squared over to what, 20 x minus six, something like that. If I did that right in my head, where I multiply by 30. So this is the reason why those things are equal because you could clear the denominators and get an integer polynomial over an integer polynomial if you wanted to. Um, does this, so this is the field of rational functions. Um, so a, another example, and I want to go back and say more about this, but if, you're, if your R is this thing, uh, for I'll just give a specific example. Uh, why am I writing that? Sorry. I had to wake up early this morning. Z bracket, I'm just going to write square root of 5. That's like a really concrete example. So this is literally uh, the set of things of the form A plus B square root of 5, such that A and B are in Z. 
literally what this means. So if you compare, can I get them both on the same screen? If you compare the notation of this and this, when people write something like this, where in place of a variable, they put something which is actually an element of some bigger ring, right? Because this, this lives inside of, say, R. These are all real numbers, right? They're not integers. They're not even rational numbers, but they are definitely real numbers. So I've like replaced x with this square root of 5. Uh, literally, this means um, any polynomial in z brackets x evaluated at x equals square root of 5. So if I were to take, but you know, for example, if I were to take something that looked like x cubed plus x squared plus 5x minus 7, and I evaluate at x equals 5, I get square root of 5 cubed plus square root of 5 squared plus 5 square root of 5 minus 7. And I can like regroup that as being like uh, negative 7 plus 5 plus, I don't know, something square root of 5, <laughs> right? This is 5 root 5. And I have five, so it's probably, this b is 10. <laughs> but I didn't figure it out before, I just called it b. So I can actually take any polynomial and it, I just get, I can simplify, after I plug in square root of five, I can simplify it down to something like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, there's sort of, I mean, uh, without getting too much into it, uh, there's sort of a, a vector space like thing happening where this is like infinite dimensional because for a basis for this, I need like one X, X squared, X cubed. X, I need like all the powers of X, but this is just like a two dimensional space. Um, anyway. So that's an example of a type of ring. And uh, maybe as like an exercise, uh, the field of fractions is Q parentheses square root of five or Q brackets square root of five, sorry. Really, the main part of the exercise being that these two things are equal to each other. Um, that polynomials evaluated at square root of 5 with entries in Q, uh, coefficients in Q, is the same set as rational functions. Yeah. So, in other words, uh, this is a field. Which might not be obvious if you just are looking at it. I'll put something about that on the homework. Any questions before I move on to the next section? Okay. So we have this thing, the Chinese remainder theorem. There's a lot of versions of the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, sort of the most classic version is like this idea that like if m and n are relatively prime integers so then meaning that they have no common prime factors then 
I can solve uh, con uh, simultaneous congruences. of the form x is equivalent to a mod m, x is equivalent to b mod n, kind of thing. So this is like the simplest version. So like for example, is there an x in z such that like x is congruent to, I don't know, three mod 10 and x is congruent to 7 mod, I don't know, something relatively prime to 10, uh, 13. And the answer, so that's a question, and the answer is yes. And um, so like, Slightly uh, more advanced version is uh, if M and N are relatively prime, then Z mod MNZ is isomorphic to Z mod MZ cross Z mod NZ. This is a ring isomorphism. And here can we uh, let's find an let's find an answer to this uh, just for fun. So uh, 13, no, 23, no, 33, does that work? Uh, yes, <laughs> great, so 33 works, it's like, okay, wow, cool. Uh, so if I had this isomorphism here, what I'm looking for is this element, like three, seven inside of this product here. And then it, I can just, if these two things are isomorphic, I can take whatever, I can take whatever is here in there. So uh, So actually any integer x congruent to 33 mod 130 will do. <laughs> so that we found one, uh, but any other one would give me, so like something else, uh, yeah. So th this, this isomorphism is, is implying that thing. Okay, and uh, a key uh, fact in the proof, which we're gonna prove something more general, um, but a key fact in the proof would be that M and N relatively prime. So this, this condition is equivalent to saying there exists uh, like X and Y in Z such that X M plus Y N is equal to one. And this, this comes from Euclid's uh, algorithm. Okay. But um, so this we've seen before, 
multiple times. I think it goes, it, it's mentioned in chapter zero of the book. But that is equivalent to saying that one is in the ideal generated by M plus the ideal generated by N. Again, here, this is sum of ideals, which is an ideal. Okay, so that is equivalent to saying that, uh, sorry, well, I want to say R, but to saying that the entire ring Z is equal to the sum of these two ideals. So the so we have a definition here. So here we're let R be just a commutative ring. Uh, so ideals A and B are called co-maximal if A plus B equals R. And this is equivalent to saying that 1 is in A plus B. Just like this condition over here. And so co-maximal, this is the like generalization sort of of relatively prime. Playing a little fast and loose there. It's not really the, the right generalization. It's, uh, but as we see in the homework, there's not a big difference between prime and maximal in this ring. Uh, so here, the, the thing we want to go for is, is the idea of being maximal. Uh, maximal sort of meaning that like when you put them together, you get you get the largest thing you could get. That's sort of the, the word there. Okay, so the actual theorem, which is called the Chinese remainder theorem. And I think it uh, is called that uh, because of uh, ancient Chinese mathematicians who studied this type of question about solving simultaneous congruences. Um, Don't know a lot about that history. Uh, though it's probably good to acknowledge that not all things were originally studied by Westerners, even though most of the things are named that way. Um, anyway, and this is uh, theorem something, 17. So, Let's let R be a commutative ring. And A1 through AK are ideals. Of R. So if you consider the map phi from R to the product, ring product, R mod A1 cross R mod A2. So this is just a set of ordered pair of ordered K tuples where I have one element in each one of these things here. And the idea here is that uh, I'm like looking in R for a solution to a certain element, uh, like to something that goes to a certain element here, um, which is like a 
each coordinate giving you a different congruence that you want to satisfy congruence mod this ideal here. Okay, so the version we did before was just two above there, and it was where the our, our ring was Z. Um, okay, given by phi of R is uh, just the thing that you want it to be. So from R to each individual quotient ring over here, you have this phi of R would equal this thing being this like quotient map. This just sort of natural thing of identifying an element with its coset. And then we're just combining, gluing all those together to get an element of that. Uh, so this is a, a ring homomorphism with kernel A1 intersect, whatever, the intersection of all these ideals. And then uh, really the content here is that if AI and AJ are co-maximal for all I not equal to J, so these are we would say pairwise co-maximal. Any two of them are uh, the sum. The sum of any two of these ideals is equal to the whole ring. Uh, then a one intersect whatever up to a k is equal to this product, which is makes it easier to write. And phi is onto, meaning, so a function be, this thing being onto is meant to sort of imply that you can always solve the simultaneous congruences. Um, in other words, uh, using the first isomorphism theorem, you get that R mod A1 a k is isomorphic to r mod a1 cross r mod a2, like that. Yeah. I swore I turned, I mean, maybe I'm not on. Do not disturb. Nope. I actually fixed it, though. So that shouldn't happen again. Okay. Have texts just been flying up there and I haven't noticed them before now? I don't know. <laughs> okay. We should try to prove that. So phi is a ring homomorphism. Uh, this is pretty much immediate. Uh, well, with kernel equal to A1 intersect through AK. Uh, let me just say exercise here. I mean, this is, this is explained in the book. Um, but actually, just after class, just do this. Just just prove that this is a ring homomorphism. It's just an exercise in trying to understand what is being written down. Because there's a lot of symbols being written down. And sometimes when a lot of symbols are written down, the thing that's underlying it is really complicated. And sometimes uh, there's really like not that much going on. There's not that much going on here. Uh, it's just, you look at this map and say, what would it take? I mean, so showing that it's a homomorphism is just sort of a matter of, un it's just sort of like putting together all these things that were already homomorphisms of just the, the quotient map. Like 
like why is that a homomorphism? Just looking at one at a time. And then the kernel is anything that goes to the zero coset, which means that R has to be in A1. If, R, if I get zero, the, all, all these being the zero coset, that means that R is in A1 and R is in A2 and R is in A3, et cetera. So that's, it has to be inside the intersection. Uh, okay, so so first you let uh, k equal two, and then we're going to use induction. And the k equals two case is already like the case that we were talking about before with integers. Um, so you. So uh, we, we're going to just assume A1 plus A2 is equal to the, the whole ring. Uh, this means that uh, there exists X in A1 and y in a2 such that x plus y equals 1 uh, since 1 is in r <laughs> okay so that's kind of knowing that something is equal to the whole ring is like equivalent to the fact that 1 is in that ideal and be that's usually a very crucial thing in studying rings to just sort of focus on the fact trying to prove something is, you know, uh, something and using the fact that something is equal to the whole ring. It's usually good enough to the fact that it has contains one if you're talking about an ideal, which we are here. So, um, if say, I don't know, A is in A1 intersect A2, then A is equal to um, AX plus AY. Or maybe uh, it might be nice to write it like x a plus a y. I mean, it's a commutative ring, right? So here, the thing to point out is that this is in a one. This is in a two, and it's also in a one, and this is in a two. So the, the entire thing is in A1, A2. Because remember, this is equal to things that look like uh, sums of element in A1 times element in A2. Right, that's the definition of product of ideals. Okay, so this this shows that A1 intersect A2 is contained in A1, A2, and uh, A1, A2 is always contained in A1 intersect A2. Any ideals. That's, so that follows from the definition. I think I mentioned it on the day we talked about products. Okay. So A1, so this was part of the claim of the theorem. Okay, so we should get to the, the main part of the claim is 
that uh, to show phi is onto. Uh, so we want to let R1 plus A1, R2 plus A2 be an arbitrary element of R mod A1 cross R mod A2. So that's what what is an element of this look like? So again, uh, we've got our phi is going from R to here. It's just the k equals 2 case. Okay. So um, the claim is just that phi of R one X plus R two Y, where X and Y are still, I'm using the same X and Y here. That, that that element hits that, right? So, um, so why is this true? So we know that uh, I mean this element right here is in A2 and this element right here is in A1. Okay, uh, and then we know also uh, Yeah, so I guess maybe let's just sort of notice here that uh, phi of like what's phi of x? It should be zero one, uh, or which is to say zero plus a one, one plus a two. Since uh, x is equal to one minus y, right? Uh, so x plus a two is equal to one plus a two. Uh, that's that's more because, um, sorry, because y equals one minus x, which is in a two. So one minus x is in a two means that these are the same. And this because x is in a two or x is in a one there, and by the same token, phi of y is one zero. So V of R1 X plus R2 Y is equal to R1, uh, sorry, 
v of r1 times v of x plus v of r2 times v of y, which equals basically r1 bar, r2 bar. I'll just write bars because I'm running out of time and space. <laughs> um, it means this. Okay. I'm running out of time to do the inductive step, so I can start with that next time. Um, because actually, I think the book waves their hands a little bit on the um, inductive part, and I think we could get a little bit more into detail about that. Actually, the this base case of k equals 2 is the most important part. Any, any questions? This is a good proof to uh, study, I think. Yeah. Uh, I just have a question. Like, since you say that phi x is 0, 1, will that make r1 to be 0? Should you flip the x and the y? So x is x right, so x is in a1 y is in a2 and x plus y is equal to 1 in this ring. Okay. So uh, x plus a1 is equal to 0 plus a1. And since, since, right, since x is in a1. And y plus, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry x plus a2 is equal to 1 plus a2 since x minus 1 is in, uh, well, I should say, I mean, it's, it's true like that, but I want to write it this way, since 1 minus x is in a2 because 1 minus x equals y. I mean, if you write if you write explicitly, right? So phi of R1, phi of x, R1. so phi of x is x plus a one, x plus a two, and this equals zero plus a one, zero plus uh no sorry, writing too fast, zero plus a one, one plus a two. So if you multiply this by phi r1, you will get 0, and then r1... Yeah, so phi, phi of uh, r1... Uh, yeah, oh, 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 thank you. Sorry. Uh, you're talking about right here... Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this should be a two and this should be a one. Yeah, that's of what course. I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, this part stays the same. Yeah, so here would be a two and a one. Sorry, so I'm fixing this. And this, I'm still recording the video, so that's good. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. So 5R2X, R1Y is the R1, R2. Sorry about that. You can see how I got mixed up. Uh, 
because there's a little flip-flop of the coordinates uh, the way it's labeled. But yeah, you do sort of mix and match here to get the right thing. Um, I just forgot that when is your office hour tomorrow? But so today, I guess, is now until 3.15, and tomorrow is 1 to 2, and I probably ha should have some on Friday, too. But I haven't said okay, when those will be, but yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I'll switch over to my office, uh, to the other session.